This is ESPN on ABC, brought to you in part by Samsung QLED TV, the official TV of ESPN College Football. Today at Bobby Dodd, how about some clean, old-fashioned hate? Presented by Trackbone as part of the Jiffy Lube Rivalry Series. It is the ACC on ESPN. It's what makes college football so special. Traditional rivalry games, and we have one for you in downtown Atlanta today here at Bobby Dodd Stadium. The annual meeting between Georgia Tech and Georgia. Always a fun place to be. Bob was shoes it alongside Dan Orlovsky. Allison Williams will join us in just a moment. Now, this is a fun place to be today for the dogs, but they have other fun things on the horizon, trying to balance getting ready for what we all know is looming next week, this week. Well, it's the playoff. It just started for Georgia a couple weeks early. And listen, the SEC East Championship is great, but the college football playoff is better. And the reality is any loss knocks them out, whether today or next week. So they have to take care of today in this rivalry game to make sure next week in the SEC SEC title game is win and you're in. Yeah, it will be an event that we will all be gearing up towards next week for Georgia. How will they handle their rivalry game today with Georgia Tech? It's a house divided here in downtown Atlanta. And we'll come back and kick it off in just a moment. You're watching the Jiffy Loop Rivalry Series. day for football here at Bobby Dodd Stadium. Bob Lashusa alongside Dan Orlovsky. Allison Williams will join us from downstairs in just a moment. Georgia Tech won the toss. They have opted to receive, so we'll have to wait to see Jake Fromm and a Georgia offense, Dan, that at times this year has been looking for some answers. Kirby Sparks been trying to help them. They had to find him fast, right? I mean, there's, there's today and and next week is the big one, but today you want to use some of your young guys to get them feeling really good and lean on your veteran quarterback. Tyler Davis turned left, and James Graham 
threw the ball right. So it's a three and out for Tech to start. Had him too. I mean, they get the pressure from Georgia. Watch the left side of the screen, number nine, Tyler Davis. If he just goes to his right on that post, that ball is going to be right on his chest. A little miscommunication. It's an option route for that tight end. You run off leverage. He guessed wrong. Presley Harvin, he can change field position, that's for sure. Did not connect with this one well, though. And a sliding catch made by Dominic Blaylock to preserve a lot of field position for a Georgia offense that, again, without Lawrence Cager, they won't have it this week, they won't have it next week in the SEC championship game. So who steps up and becomes the go-to for Jake Frost? Listen, it has to be George Pickens, the true freshman, who has in some ways, but it's really okay. If that guy's one-on-one, -on -one, I trust if I throw him the ball, he'll go get it. Dominic Blaylock, who's had some big plays in the Florida game, in the Auburn game, big touchdowns. Robertson has got to do some stuff. I want to see them utilize DeAndre Swift in the pass game. But they have to play better consistently if they're going to win today and then moving forward next week. They'll open up with a throw from Fromm. It's knocked down and read beautifully by Quez Jackson. Second down and 10. They tried to come out of the game with a little bit of a run-pass option, and Quez Jackson was just brought to the football, and he gets his hands right up in the passing lane. They're trying to get that to Charlie Warner. Trey Swilling, the corner's right there, so good start for Georgia Tech defensively, understanding their game plan. Swift empties the backfield. Rahm on a slant. That's broken up. Trey Swilling knocked it away from Kiaris Jackson. Now it will be third down and ten. Can I ask a quick early question? Fire away. What are you doing if you are Georgia coming out and spreading out a defense that you outweigh by 25 pounds a guy? Well, we, we've talked about getting these young receivers feeling good and starting fast and trying to jump on football teams. And so a little bit is finding the start of this game going, okay, let's throw it around a little bit and let these young guys make some plays. Obviously, back-to-back -back incompletions is not where you want it to be. Third down to 10. Three-man rush. Safran has time. Steps up, avoids a sack. Fires one. It's also broken up. Demetrius Robertson was the intended receiver. Caleb Oliver got a hand in. So three throws from Fromm. Three passes defensed by Georgia Tech. Climb of the pocket, but watch where the ball is. That's behind Robertson. I've had Jake Fromm's back for a long time. Harping on these receivers needing to make some plays, but the slant on second down to Kiaris Jackson was behind him, and then that throw on third down to Demetrius Robertson is behind him. Jake Fromm needs to get his accuracy back. Jake Camarda with a wobbly kick, and will bounce inside the 30. Marion Brown's going to let it roll, and it takes a hop for Georgia inside the 15. Out of bounds at about the 13. 53 yard putt. the Big Ten West and a birth of the Big Ten title game on the line between Ohio State well, against Ohio State between Wisconsin and Minnesota they square off at 3:30 Eastern on ABC and the ESPN app and that has become a Big Ten playoff game to see which of these two teams is going to get a crack at the Buckeyes next weekend Speaking of next weekend, right here in Atlanta, these dogs will be back. And they'll be taking on LSU in the SEC championship game. But first things first, they've got to take care of Georgia Tech today. And the Yellow Jackets start at their own 13-yard line. A little old school. Back to the days of Paul Johnson. They're on a little option. And James Graham picks up about a yard and a half. Nolan Smith was there to make the stop. Like that job by Georgia's defense. Stokes, the corner stayed outside and then allowed Nolan Smith, number four, kind of play in between the pitch man and the quarterback. They'll have to respect number four, James Graham's speed. I mean, James Graham can fly at quarterback. Look at this, a little shift to the backfield, bring both tight ends, kind of looking like the Baltimore Ravens and an inverted wishbone. Diamond formations. And get out to about the 19-yard line. 
four yards for James Graham, a redshirt freshman that needs to do what today to give Georgia Tech their best chance? Don't force the football. This is a really good defense, Georgia, covering people up. Second thing, he will be one of the faster guys on the field. Let, let that shine. And then whether it's the zone read game, whether it's the RPO game, whether it's the pass game, they don't give him people to look at. He just needs to see certain areas. Be really clear in how he looks at it. See a quick throw out to this trip set at the top of the screen right now, thinking you have some numbers. Amarian Brown, the wide receiver, now in the backfield, three on the play clock. Graham to Brown. Caught. Now they say incomplete. Had it in his hands right in front of his own bench, but it was knocked away with Tay Crowder there in coverage. This is such a good play by Tay Crowder. Watch the right hand swipe at the ball right there and find it and knock it away, but he stayed on. Marion Brown's hit, made sure he wasn't allowed to cross face or get in front of him, and then drove on the football, knock it away. Great play by the senior linebacker. Better than 50%. Three and outs the last 37 drives for Georgia Tech. Harvin, and this time he gets into one. Blaylock from his own 35. Makes a man miss. Blaylock with speed. Great return for Georgia. They'll start at the Georgia Tech 36 yard line. A 30 yard return off of a 46 yard punt. Jake Brown back to work when we come back. College football on ABC is presented by TrackPhone, the new TrackPhone Wireless. Now you're in control. In part by USAA, proud supporter of the military community. What you're made of, we're made for. And Jiffy Lube, you can do more in a Jiffy. Since 1995, the Governor's Cup has gone to the winner. The Georgia Tech Georgia annual rivalry game. Well, hashtag they like. Here at Georgia Tech, Teenage W Little G. The disrespect of the small letter. I was gonna say, should I let you figure out what those letters stand for? Maybe that could be our half life trivia question. To figure out the H. Well, after three incompletions to start the game for Jake Fromm, now he's under center with DeAndre Swift, the long setback. Starting at the Georgia Tech 36 yard line. And there's Swift. And he's brought down after a gain of a couple. Well, they came out aggressive, and first play of the game, they go RPO, a couple hands get on it for Georgia Tech, they come back with a slant, next play on the back shoulder, and then third down, great climb in the pocket, but then it's behind Demetrius Robertson, 0 for 3 to start this game, and Jake Fromm's having a conversation with Kirby Smart going, I don't know what's going on with our ball location. Jake Fromm's frustration. I get it. I mean, that's two third downs where Georgia Tech has decided we're just going to cover you up and trust that your guys can't beat our guys. And Jake Fromm's had time. It's just no one has separated. First down, first one he misses. This last one he misses on a scramble. A shade under 50. And as smooth as could be, Blankenship knocks it through. on the line today, but that's the 
trophy that Georgia wants a chance to play for. The National Championship Trophy presented by Dr. Pepper here in Atlanta for this game. Whose hands will it be in midway through January? And you can see Mercedes-Benz Stadium off in the distance. That's where the dogs will play next week. They've got the early 3-0 lead over Georgia Tech in their rivalry game this week. Bob Schusen here with Dan Orlovsky and Allison Williams. Anya Thomas is back deep to receive the kick for Blankenship. A line drive. And he takes it on a hop at the one. Gets ahead of Steen across the 25 out to the 26-yard line where he's brought down. Our first chance today to get an update from Cassidy Hubbard. Thanks, Bob. The performance above brought to you by Jersey Mike Subs. A lot of action in the game so far after Michigan scored on the opening drive. Ohio State's response right back. J.K. Dobbins of the PAT puts Ohio State up 7-6 in the first. Bob, Dan, back to you guys. All right, Cassidy, thanks very much. Georgia's got the early 3-0 lead here over Georgia Tech. And we'll see if Georgia Tech can get something going offensively after three and outs on their first two possessions. Mason lost a yard. Monty Rice got there first. Malik Herring came in to finish him off. Just complimentary football for Georgia. So good defensively. Herring did a nice job of crashing down, and Monty Rice just played with patience at linebacker, knowing the ball was going to bounce outside, and he's waiting for the ball carrier. This, this defense is one of the best in the country. Doesn't get talked about enough how good they play all 11 together. Time Mason is able to grind down a couple of yards, so it'll be third down at nine. You know, Joe Detect, their first three third downs have gotten into three by O formations. They put three receivers to one side and a tight end attached to line of scrimmage by himself. And the middle of the field has been there. Now they're in a two-by-two two set. They love to run quarterback draw to these situations or switch routes by these receivers. That's Amari and Brown in motion. Graham, long throw, incomplete. Short hop didn't know where near Brown, and it's another Tech three and out. Well, they motioned over Amari and Brown for a reason to try to get him some leverage off of the coverage. Really good job by Mark Webb, the safety of closing ground. And I think James Graham's just wastes that throw. It's a tight window. He's not trying to fit it. That's not his game to be dialed in perfect type of throws. Flags down. start offense number 43 five yard penalty fourth down we've had five offensive possessions in the game so far and neither team has a first down Biggest play of the game so far was the Dominic Blaylock punt return that got Georgia into plus territory, the short field, and they were able to kick a field goal off of that, and they'll have pretty good field position this time around as well as Harvin's punt goes out of bounds at the 36-yard line. By Georgia, so a 42-yard punt this season. Taco Bell is celebrating student sections and passionate fans like these by awarding the Liv Moss Student Section of the Year. Yellow Jacket student section is already on the national watch list. Go to ESPN.com slash Taco Bell and see how your school can compete or get the committee's attention by using the hashtag LiveMoss student section. I think Georgia Tech is going to challenge Georgia on the outside, and I would like to see DeAndre Swift a little bit more of this bit involved in the pass game. Well, steady runs it here. Gets out to the 40-yard line, picks up four. Back down by Jaquan Henderson. Jordan Tech.
Vivek is committing right now. They're putting five guys up on the line of scrimmage, kind of overloading towards where Georgia puts their tight end. Only one linebacker in the box and saying, we're going to try and own the line of scrimmage, get vertical off some of these blocks, and not give a lot of these push, double push creases for this run game. Two tight ends. DeAndre Swift alone set back on second and six. Swift finds a cutback play, and he gets loose. Across the 50, easily picking up the opening first down of the game. We met with Kirby Smart yesterday, and it seemed like the overall philosophy for Georgia was going to be, we need to get all these different guys involved yeah. and spread things around. But just in a silo in this game, do you think it's DeAndre Swift, Brian Harrion, and that offensive line that gives them the best chance to win? Listen, yes, uh, but I also think that they need to utilize today to their advantage for next week. And I think they need to show some stuff on tape that they plan into the eye, minds of LSU that they can counter with next week. Harrion, steamrolls for a first down. 12 more. And part of this is also figuring out who you are going to be without Lawrence Cager because now you know it's not a week-to-week -week thing. You know you're going to be without him. So as you go into next week, okay, who can we rely on for some packages or some plays? Is it Zamir White or James Cook or Swift and the receivers? I mean, there's a bunch of options, but you got to figure out the stuff that those guys like it that you feel like you can execute. And today, the challenge is to win the football game also figure that out at the same time. It's James Cook in motion. Arian takes it. He's got a couple of yards. Brentavious Blanton is there to bring him down. And I guess it is a, a very interesting line you walk. You don't want to disrespect Georgia Tech and mess around and be in a football game that you never expected would be close. But as a result, you do want to, at the same time, I guess, use this game to kind of oil the wheels of your offense and try and get it a little bit more in rhythm. That was the, the word that, that James Coley used. That was the word that Kirby Smart used. We need some rhythm out of our offense going into next week. As Harry is into the secondary and is about three yards shy of a first down. Quez Jackson made the tackle. And again, I think that you have such respect for LSU and Dave Aranda defensively that they're going to watch this tape and go, okay, who are they now that they know they don't have Cager? And you should, as a coaching staff in your Georgia, start planting some seeds and make some deposits and tendencies that you know you have counters to for next week or wrinkles to for next week. And you believe that they'll be so scouted that you can throw some haymakers early on. But this is the down, third down. Don't, don't be surprised if they try and pop a run. Instead, it's a back shoulder throw down the sideline. Fromm drops it in beautifully. Tyler Simmons to the two-yard line, 25-yard game. Good route by Simmons. Up top, watch the left-hand stab. Get the defensive back off of late hands. Great throw, great route, great catch. The dogs play with tempo. Arian up the middle at the goal line. Reaches the ball out, and he's in for the touchdown. some rhythm. Harry and Swift running the ball and a great back shoulder throw. I love the finish of the drive. Great throw on third down, running in for a touchdown. Dogs up top. Bob Schusen alongside Dan Orlovsky, Allison Williams down on the field. Georgia, Georgia Tech's a clean old-fashioned hate. And the dogs have what you would anticipate, an early 10-0 lead. Georgia Tech about to get the football back. And Jake Fromm threw a very confident ball to Tyler Simmons to set up the touchdown. I love that drive. I mean, that play, was, that drive was seven plays. Six of them were runs. And like you said, a really big time third down throw from Fromm to Simmons. And then they punched it in. 
touchback off the kickoff from Blankenship. And this season, every field goal and extra point made by participating universities. Allstate will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. Thank you to Allstate. This is the fourth top 15 defense that Georgia Tech has played against this season. And this might be the best of them all. Off play action. Graham looking downfield. Wanted to take a shot. Now he's out of the pocket. Checks it down along the sideline and misses Jordan Mason, who was wide open at the 30-yard line. It's a good decision by James Graham. This is something that Georgia Tech likes to do offensively. Talking to their offensive coordinator, Dave Patton, out, he wants to take two shots per quarter. And so they're going to run the football and then take their shots with some play action or just drop back. And so Georgia does a good job covering it up. It's not there. Throw it away if you're the young quarterback. You see this formation. They keep taking these tight ends, initially lining them up, see how Georgia responds, and then bringing them back into the backfield. It's a lot like I had said of the Baltimore Ravens kind of zone run jet sweep game. Quarterback run. Backing his way out to the 29-yard line, a gain of four. It's Grams. It will be third down and six. Monty Rice, another tackle. But another impressive play by Nolan Smith. He's the guy that kind of put James Graham in conflict right there. And this is where Georgia wants to live. They'll be aggressive on first and second downs. And then on third down, it's really not a pressure down for them. They're going to try to take away what you do off your formations. They'll, they'll populate places. Look at the put numbers here. Don't be surprised if pressure comes away. They like to show you stuff and then bring it away. The dog show blitz. They do rush four. Graham out of the pocket. Breaks a tackle and lost the ball. Well, one way or the other, it's either Georgia ending up with a fumble recovery inside the 30-yard line, or they're about to get the ball back with yet another Georgia Tech punt. And it is a recovery by the Ramblin' Wreck as Richard LeCount stripped it away from James Graham. James Graham decides to scramble. LeCount just swipes at it with his right hand. He gets a, just the bottom tip of that football, but I like it. Georgia showed pressure one side, brought it with the count from the other. Their catch made by Blaylock. Georgia has the football back. Richard LeCount stripped it away. And now the defense on the sideline. Offense back to work for Georgia. That ball thrown behind Robertson, but Demetrius Robertson able to reach back and make an eight-yard grab. Swift, no one to contain the outside. There goes Swift. You can see that coming from a mile away. There's just nobody on the near side of the field to try and keep DeAndre Swift between the tackles. Well, when your left tackle is the size of a skyscraper and he closes off the line of scrimmage, Andrew Thomas with a great block at the point of attack. Blitz off the edge. It's picked up. Fromm takes a shot for Robertson, and that's deflected. Might have been Wanye Thomas that got a hand on it before it got through to Robertson. Tries to get this ball down the middle of the field to Robertson and Wanye Thomas. Not only the timing of that hand, but this is a 6-2 safety. That, that length allows him to tip that ball because it was going to be an on-target throw to Robertson from Brown. Screen, James Cook. Gets a couple of blocks, gets a first down, and gets some more. 20-yard game. Caleb Kate bumped him out. I mean, I like this for Georgia's offense because you took DeAndre Swift off the field, but then you put Zamir White and Cook on the field. Two tailbacks. How does the defense handle it? And they've done that a little bit this year, but again, this is something that you're now showing LSU on tape for next week. Going, okay, how are we going to handle? Because both those guys, strong, 
good out in space, can be part of the pass protection, good pass receivers. Jet sweep, Tyler Simmons gets down the sideline. He's got another first down. Now the full arsenal starting to show itself for a Georgia offense that wanted to get to a rhythm, and it looks like they're finding the touches. You got so many people that need to get touches for this Georgia offense, and after that first drive, there's a little rhythm here. There's a little bit of rhythm, not only for the players, but for Goldie, their offensive coordinator, of going, okay, who can I get the ball to, and, and where can we get them with what they do well? right there. Beautiful read, better throw. Seventeen nothing. And we're coming right back in 30 seconds. Taking control the way a Dogs fan wanted to see them. And they have done exactly that. Seventeen nothing. Georgia on top of Georgia Tech. Ramblin' Wreck have not picked up a first down yet. Charlie Warner with his first touchdown of the season. And Blankenship put this one through the back of the end zone. Coming up this week on Sunday NFL Countdown. Now the legend of Heisman Trophy winner and MVP favorite Lamar Jackson was born. Plus Randy Moss ranks the best catches for this week's college football action. And the crew reveals their top turkey bowl play from across the country. It's Countdown, Sunday morning, 10 a.m. on ESPN. you got to feel really good right now coming off those past two drives if you're Georgia's offense. The run game's gotten going, and Jake Fromm's been really, really good with his decision-making and ball placement. Hasten. 29-yard line, he picks up four. Georgia Tech hasn't had a play longer than four yards on any of their first four possessions. I, I, that, that, to me, that speaks more to Georgia's defense, though. I mean, they've done that to a lot of teams this year. We talk about great defenses in college football, and Georgia needs to be in the conversation. And that will be what dominates the talk for the next week is them versus that really good offense in Baton Rouge. Mason tries to bounce it outside. A yard. It'll be third down at about four and a half. Jordan Davis was there to bring him down. I just think Georgia's defense, I've talked about making you play with your backup players in a backup scheme or a secondary scheme, but Georgia's defense does such a good job of understanding what the weakness of the call is. Their players are very smart going, okay, if we're, we're, if we're in this zone, this is where defenses will try to attack it, or if we're in this kind of man coverage, this is the stuff we need to be alert for. It's a credit to Kirby and his staff because they're so smart with how defenses try to, or offenses are trying to attack them. Not sure why Georgia Tech didn't at least go to the line and try and hard count Georgia before the end of the quarter, but they're just going to let the quarter clock run all the way down. End of one. Georgia in control. Hey, advisor. <laughs> There's always emotion involved on senior day, but especially here at Georgia Tech, and especially for redshirt junior Chris Martin, who honored his friend Brandon Adams today before the game. Adams would have been a senior, but he passed away suddenly in March after suffering a fall. Martin was one of his closest friends and is wearing his number 90 jersey today, as he also did in the first game of the year against Clemson. He presented that jersey to Adams' family, who described the moment as heartwarming. And Brandon Adams' entire family here, as Allison said, on what would have been his senior day, and it was very emotional. Only about five minutes before we kicked the game off have been honoring with that heart patch on the back of their uniforms, Brandon Adams, the entire season. Unfortunately for the offense for Georgia Tech, it's another three and out. 
Presley Harvin. Hang time on the punt to Blaylock. It's going to go out of bounds. I really like the adjustment that Georgia's offense has done. So early on, Georgia Tech decided to make some gambles. They're going to shift some bodies towards the tight end, guessing Georgia would run the football that way, get a little push at the point of attack. It allows number 44, Quest Jackson, to play slow. So now Georgia Tech does it again. They're going to shift to one, one tight end. There's no numbers to the offense's right. That's where Georgia decides to run the ball with DeAndre Swift for a big game. I love the in-game adjustment Georgia made offensively with James Coley running away from where Georgia Tech was going to put some of their numbers. There goes James Cook in motion, and Fromm throws it over his head with a blitz coming off the edge from Caleb Oliver. It'll be second down and 10, as that was a forward pass. I think that play probably personifies this offense of this year for Jake Fromm the best. Georgia Tech was right. They got you. But Jake Fromm doesn't hurt the football team. So often quarterbacks will try to force that football or fit it in somewhere that it doesn't belong. Throw it away. Make the right play. He's not going to hurt his team. Really well done. Quick hitter. Incomplete. Intended for Robertson, who didn't have his head around by the time Fromm threw the out and underthrew him as well. So now it's third down and 10. That's on Robertson. Jake Fromm signaled out to him like, hey, this ball's coming out fast because of this pressure. Robertson has to play with a little bit more urgency right there. It's a big kind of feel good third down for this offense. Of the screen, you're going to get one on one coverage right here. It's Kiaris Jackson. Fromm looks the other way instead. Long throw to the sideline, incomplete. Eli Wolf, the tight end, laid out, couldn't haul it in. And it will be a three and out for the dogs. Wanye Thomas just undercut Eli Wolf and made it for a little bit more of a difficult throw because you got to get it up over that defender. Kyrus Jackson won on his one-on-one -on -one route as he came an inbreaker. Thought Jake Fromm should have gone there. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's an easier throw. The middle field is vacated because of the pressure. But that's the thing. He's got to find some guys that he can trust in those moments, to count on in those moments. Line drive punt. Ugly but effective from Camarda as he got it off with the rush coming and gets it all the way down just shy of the 20-yard line. 45-yard punt. Georgia Tech, though, still without a first down on offense. ESPN, home of the New Year's Six and the college football playoff. Welcome back to ESPN College Football, presented by Trackphone, part of the Jiffy Lube Rivalry Series. Bob Wischusen, Dan Orlovsky, Allison Williams, here in Atlanta. And the Georgia Tech fans here at Bobby Dodd looking for their team to pick up their first first down. Jemias Griffin in the game of tailback. Play action, though, for Graham. Floats one on the right flat. And that'll be a modest game. The ball pops out. Malachi Carter couldn't hold on. And they'll say incomplete pass. Malachi Carter crosses the field. Oh. Are we sure? Monty Rice looks like that ball gets popped out. I mean, he looks like he makes that catch. If there's clear recovery, which there was not for Georgia, replay could stop and rule that a fumble. And the true freshman picks up two yards. It'll be third down and eight. Well, rivalry games bring out great traditions. And some of the best this week, you can't use yellow mustard at Georgia. Not allowed. No red clothing. You can't even write in red. 
if you're at Georgia Tech. Now, the Nats, well, that's what they call the folks at Georgia Tech if you're a Georgia fan. Georgia North Avenue Trade School is what it stands for. The hashtag, have you figured it out yet? Nats? No. Oh. THW. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, you two, do know what that means. To non heaven <laughs> with Georgia. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Here's it, but I got an issue. Like, What's my man doing right here? Like, Georgia has got fan. a Georgia fan uh, shirt on, but there's mustard on that dog We now. found a violator. There, there, that, that is a, hey, son, let's have a conversation. Now, Georgia, they ring the chapel bell after wins, I believe, until midnight, but they ring it all night when they win this game. And their defense forces another three and out as Harvin boots it away. Dropped on by Blaylock. And it's still loose. Like Georgia Tech gets it. A special teams mistake that gives the Yellow Jackets a little life as that ball went right through the hands of Dominic Blaylock. goes right through the elbows. Watch Cooksey come flying right there. Great effort by Cooksey to get down the field and recover that. Think quarterback run here out of this empty formation for Georgia Tech. And the Ramblin' Wreck take advantage in the red zone. James Graham. There is quarterback run. Inside the 15, got inside the 14-yard line. And an opportunity for us again to check in with Cassidy. Thanks, Bob. Back to Ann Arbor and back and forth they go after an Ohio State 57-yard touchdown. Michigan responds with this Shea Patterson to Donovan Peoples-Jones 25-yard score. It's 14-13 Buckeyes after one. Bob Dan, back to you. All right, Cassidy. Well, Georgia Tech's trying to make a game of it in this rivalry game down 17-0. Their offense still doesn't have a first down. Their offense hasn't produced a play of longer than four yards. But a special teams mistake gives them a chance to score here. And they have struggled in the red zone. They're going up against one of the best defenses in college football. And now they want to call a timeout. So we'll step aside as well. College football presented by TrackPhone on ABC is brought to you by Pacific Life. 150 years strong. Protection and retirement solutions for your future. Ice Cold Dr. Pepper, the official drink of Fansville. And Taco Bell's Rolled Chicken Tacos Party Packs. It's been since 1999 and apparently before the advent of color photography since <laughs> Georgia Tech beat Georgia at home. They've won a couple of times in Athens, but the last time they won here at Bobby Dodd Stadium back in 1999. And they're facing second down and seven after a timeout called. A fumbled punt by Dominic Blaylock, giving Georgia Tech a chance to get on the board. And right up the middle, it's Mason. About a yard and a half shy of the first first down for Georgia Tech, so it will be third down. Looks like it's about two. Yeah, and so now that it's third and two, if I'm Georgia Tech, this becomes four down territory for me. And so I'm very conscious of that play call. There's no way I'm throwing this football. I want to get the ball with number four, James Graham, and the opportunity to keep it in his hands, whether it's a jet motion zone read, an option off the edge, something where he's having the football and knowing I'm going to go for it on fourth down as well. Closer to third down and three as they mark him down at the 10. Keeper, Graham, and it looks like he's got the first down. It'll be first and goal at the six as finally Georgia Tech is able to move the chains. Jay Crowder made the stop, one of the 12 finalists for the Buckus Award. But now the reaction from the Georgia Tech fans realizing they finally have a fresh set of downs. 
that's the best thing that you could say about Jeff Collins in this Georgia Tech football team right now. Everyone is aware of the lack of talent and the transition and whatnot. Watch the tape, the effort that these kids play with, the, the energy that is still there, the belief in the midst of some difficult times. And it's a credit to Jeff Collins and, and, and the appreciation of the players that they will play hard for their head coach. They're going to do some unique things to try and steal some stuff. Outstanding job by Georgia Tech. Good situations for quarterback run numbers wise. A slant instead. And it looks like the first catch for Amari and Brown. But Jeff Collins told us he's trying to change the culture at Georgia Tech as well as flip the roster. He wants football to be fun. And he said when you guys come to practice, you're not just robots. You know, we're gonna have Techno Tuesday and old school mm -hmm. Atlanta Wednesday and play some R and B and un the rolling on the field was a completed pass. The previous play is under further review. They're going to check and see if Brown did hold on to the football. But he said that even on the first day of spring practice, the first meeting that the players walked into, he had a DJ spinning records. I mean, he wanted these guys to feel like football was fun. And as we take another look to see if Brown held on to that ball, and you can see the ball come out, so it looks like this is a good job by the replay booth to buzz down to make sure Brown had it, and it looks like he did not. You can see that ball touching right there, and it's going to move. Once that ball touches and moves. But I, I, we, we should get into Jeff Collins a little bit, right? I mean, they're transitioning. From Paul Johnson and his success, and totally remaking the program. And so he's had to go to the extreme with so many things of the hashtags and the sayings because 
he wants this this institution to be one that is based on effort and based on commitment and based on family they've made it a point to have snack time the night before a game where it's everybody's family comes the players spend two hours with each other the ball hit the ground therefore is an incomplete pass will be second down and ten they're going to talk about uh, what's the most important stuff this offseason they're going to start a club 10 10 january 5th it's going to be an actual club that the players dj as you enter they got to gain 10 pounds each player and they got to figure out figure out a way to gain 10 feet as a program meaning some of their close losses this year but it, i mean these kids love them it's fun college football should be fun and jeff collins is bringing that with hopefully some wins back to georgia tech They'll run it here with Mason. It's up a yard, so it's going to be third down and nine. And he was honest with us yesterday, Allison, about the type of game he knew this was going to be. Well, he knew it would be a, a tight game for sure. And, guys, one of the things he needs to do to catch up with a team like Georgia is to get some size, right? Dan mentioned the 10 pounds they want to gain in the offseason. Part of that means no egg white omelets. That is actually written into the player oath that they have to sign. And it goes back to when he saw Zach Quinney at Waffle House eating an egg white omelet because they had to keep their white down in the old triple option. No. Not anymore. They actually had the sign that they would only eat regular omelet. There's quarterback run. It's going nowhere. Great job by the Georgia defense to deal with the surprise onside kick and sudden change. That's a true freshman, Nolan Smith, a former number one overall recruit there to make the stop. And you can see this is a pregame. They're trying to gain weight before the game starts. This is a pregame lift for Georgia Tech. No time that is wasted for this program right now. Do you subscribe to the no egg white omelet? Look at me. You sh <laughs> yeah, exactly. You should have gotten down there at Muscle Beach and gotten some weights. Uh, absolutely. Presley Harvin trying to pin one deep. Can't keep it out of the end zone. I did my curls last night. You were with me. Yeah, different kind of curl. Yeah. Hubbard here. Let's take a look at one of AT&T's best performances. Number three, Clemson at South Carolina. Trevor Lawrence drops the snap but recovers and throws his third TD of the first half. This one to Justin Ross. Tigers up 21-3. to three. This one over on ESPN. Bob Dan, back to you. All right, Clemson team, they are rolling as they go through the rest of their schedule as well. And Dan, they will not be challenged until they play a playoff game. No, I mean, they're going to play what looks like to be Virginia as they take care today they'll play Virginia in the ACC title game uh, and, and they're playing as good as anyone in America right now. Harriet trying to get back to the line of scrimmage. Christian Campbell got him behind the line. It's time for our Aflac trivia question. A total of six FBS and FCS teams play in the state of Georgia. Can you name them? That was a hard question. I had like four. No shot you could finish the final two. Arian. It's across the 25 at the 26 yard line. Picks up six. It'll be third down and four. As we approach the midway point of the second quarter, it was 17 nothing Georgia. But then momentum shifted a bit with Dominic Blaylock fumbled a punt. Georgia Tech went in from the red zone. And then they surprised the dogs with an onside kick. But had to punt it away. Georgia Tech's played a ton of single high safety. Watch these two safeties. I think they're going to go back, play a little bit of a read quarters, work the middle of the field if you're Jake Fromm. Fromm out of the pocket. He'll run for it and spin for a first down. Gets walloped, but easily picks up a fresh set of downs hit by Demetrius Knight. Guys, one of the players they thought had to step up without Lawrence Cager was George Pickens, but we really haven't seen him out there today. I've been watching him this second quarter. He has not been out on offense. I'm told he did participate at one point, but I'm watching him on the sideline. He seems fine. He's been smiling, kind of walking around, not holding his helmet, though, and definitely limited. 
Fromm takes a shot. This is Tyler Simmons. We watched George Pickens throughout warm-ups. He took part in the full pregame warm-up. True freshman that's got 32 catches for five touchdowns this season. But he is on the bench. He has not been a regular participant at all for Georgia's offense in the first half. And he's the guy that is going to be so important for this football team next week. Listen. These are guesses and these are assumptions, but George Pickens is not playing for a reason. I mean, this would be a massive game for him to get some stuff going. If you're playing everybody else in your offense, he certainly would be a guy playing. Power toss to DeAndre Swift. Lost the football. It's knocked out. Georgia Tech thinks they have it. Quez Jackson calls the fumble. Who's got it at the bottom of the pile? after Quez Jackson knocked it out. Helmet right on the football. Quez Jackson, ball pops in the air. And then Justice Dingle right there waiting for that football. Put his helmet right on and off DeAndre Swift. All right, do something with it now if you're Georgia Tech. You had just gotten that onside kick. Didn't do anything with it. You got to do something with this turnover right now. It's the third straight possession where Georgia Tech has begun in plus territory. Lose Jordan Mason. Picks up nine. Ridden down by Monty Rice. I like that they pulled both guards. Got Mason out. Really good job. Front side by the tight end tackle. Pushing the line of scrimmage just a little bit. Open up a big hole for Jordan Mason. I'd love them to see him be a little bit aggressive here. It's second and one. You're in four down territory off that turnover right now. Be aggressive with the play call. It's a run instead. And short of the first down is Mason. Looks like just a hair shy. Crowder and Rice double team the tackle. So now it's third down and about a foot. By the way, that nine yard gain for Mason on first down. That's the longest play from scrimmage so far in the first half for this Georgia Tech offense. Some extra bodies come in. Three tight ends on the field right now for Georgia Tech offensively. Cottrell, a big physical back. Look for them to run behind number nine. The first down carry for Mason. And he just moves the pile for about four yards. Nice job by Tyler Davis there, just coming across and just pushing people to create some change at that line of scrimmage for Mason. If you've watched Georgia Tech this season, they are a shot-taking offense. Yep. Where are the shots, and when do you think one's going to show up? They tried one right off the play action. It wasn't there. I mean, it's coming. There is one coming here soon in this drive. They just haven't had the ball enough to actually dial them up. They've had so many three and outs. Marion Brown is the guy that they like to take shots to, number 10. Georgia doesn't give you a lot pre-snap that you feel good with it. This is not a play where I would call it just off look. I think you continue to trust that run game. Tyler Davis in motion. They counter the other way with Mason. Jump cut inside the 20. Down in the red zone with a first down for Georgia Tech. J.R. Reed made the stop, but it's a gain of 11. You're, you're seeing Tyler Davis come in motion, and he doesn't get set. He moves before the snap. That messes with the defense big time. Brown, there's a shot towards the end zone. Incomplete, way up over the head of Amari and Brown. These drives become pretty simple. Georgia continues to blitz from the field. They're bringing one guy and blitzing him from the field. Georgia Tech needs to run away from that pressure. That's what they've done. Run away from it. Everyone's going to slant with that blitz. If you shut down that moving defensive line, you're going to get some big creases in your run game. 
So the run should be more concentrated to the short side of the field. Correct. And the blitz is about, coming from the wide side. Absolutely. Well, this is straight ahead run for Jemias Griffin. And the true freshman gets down to about the 16-yard line. Stuffed by Michael Barnett after a gain of two. So a big third down coming here for Georgia Tech in the red zone. And, and they, they have not been good when it comes to the throw game on third down. They've tried to get to Amari Brown a couple times. Watch where he is. They, they like to motion him, whether it's across the formation, out of the backfield. The big thing for James Graham. Don't force the football here. You're in a field goal position, and don't take any sacks. So if you do see a seam, and number 10's not there, put your foot in the ground and get forward. Play clock down to seven. Graham gets them set. Play clock at three. Will they get the snap off? They do, just in time, but it looks like a timeout was called from the sideline by Jeff Collins. Before the snap. So it's a 30-second timeout, and we'll be back in 30. Time to answer our AFLAC trivia question. Six FBS and FCS teams play in Georgia, and this is the group on the FBS level. These two teams, along with Georgia Southern and Georgia State, and then Kennesaw State and Mercer on the FCS level. If you got all six of those, then you are a true Georgia State football fan. A historian, a savant. After the timeout. Graham in the shotgun on third down. Here comes a blitz. He's out of the pocket. He's going to tuck it under and run. Stiff arm. Now what do you do? Do you take the points and make it a one-score game? Or do you try and go for it on fourth and two from the 10-yard line? I kick this. Yeah, and there's no hesitation from Jeff Collins. He sends out the field goal group. Don't forget, those are back-to-back -back series of turnovers, essentially. I mean, the onside kick you got nothing out of, and then you get the turnover on the fumble by Swift. You, you must go get some points. And also, this is a game. Like, get this kick in. You are in a one-possession football game. Tim King from 27. there though I do I like this out of coach Collins I mean yes go make the kick just kind of pushes it wide right but I like the embrace from the head coach I'm gonna need you you got to make those kicks I believe in you you'll get another moment another opportunity well the muffed punt for Dominic Blaylock becomes a touchdown you steal a possession with a surprise onside kick, you get nothing. Now DeAndre Swift gives you a turnover. You start in plus territory, you come away empty as well. So Georgia minus two in the plus minus ratio, and yet they still have a 10 point lead. Zamir White picked up a yard. Coming up at halftime, we'll check in. It's the Capital One halftime report. Rivalry highlights from all around college football and previewing later today and tonight. The Big Ten West battle on deck as soon as we're done here on ABC between Wisconsin and Minnesota and the Iron Bowl as well today. Massive games. This is the best week in college football. We're seeing a good game here today. Not many people expect this to be a 10-point football game right now. From in the flat to Harriet. Not much. Nice read by Christian Campbell. This is a big possession for Georgia offensively. They start the third quarter with the football. They have a chance to put together back-to-back -back possessions and really put a throttle hold on this game if they can pick up a third down here. Hold on to the football and maybe score points before halftime. And, and remember, they're still searching for their guy. You know, like Georgia Tech early on played a bunch of man coverage. No one was winning. Last time they played two high safeties. Right now there's three safeties playing right here. Look at these three safeties. They're going to force Jake Fromm to get through a zone look. Fromm underneath. Harry looking for the sticks. And with speed, he got there. First down. 
Georgia with just over two minutes to go in the half. I can't express how good this is by Jake Fromm. I mean, third and eight. The play call doesn't get anyone open. Coverage is there. There's one person to throw the football to, and you've got to trust him to go make that play. This has been Harrion's drive so far, and he's got another first down. Trey Hill, the center, lost his helmet, so he's going to have to come off the field for a play. some run game here if you're Georgia. You've got all three of your timeouts. This is one of those fine lines where you want to milk the clock. They don't ever get the football back, but you must go score some points. Cade Mays, who has played left guard, right tackle, right guard, even some center. He will slide over and at least for one play, snap the football here on first and ten. Zamir White breaks free. Pops out of the pocket. Samir White. But I'm, I'm sure everyone was waiting. Like Jake Fromm snapped the football, but he was getting them into the right play. He saw the numbers to his left were more advantageous to run the football there. So you take the five or six seconds to communicate to everyone equals a big run. And you have all three timeouts. Correct. Clock stopping on first downs and college football helps you as well. Plenty of time for Georgia. And Jake Fromm, as a veteran quarterback, knows it. They're going to run it again. And this time it's read by Georgia Tech. David Curry knifes through to meet Samir White behind the line. That might not be the worst time for a timeout for Georgia. Just not going to call location. one. Just mid right guard goes to right. The right guard, Kate Mays, thought they were running left. And that's why Curry became unblocked. But Bob, to your, like, they, they should have caught the timeout by now. Yeah, a lot of times coming off the clock, down inside of 40 seconds to go, just after we praised their patience and clock management. Second down and 13. And now they're probably looking more towards field goal range. From rifles one to the sideline, the Simmons. 25 seconds to go. Trey swilling there in coverage. It'll be third down and short. going to play some man coverage here. I put Simmons one-on-one -on -one by himself. If Simmons, if you like your pre-snap matchup, if you're Jake Fromm right here in one-on-one -on -one coverage, you take that. If not, be alert for DeAndre Swift out of the backfield. Swift bounces outside, turns the corner, and has the first down. of Georgia football that had back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons. DeAndre Swift is on that list. From sacked back to the 40. Justice Dingle, another big play for Georgia defensively. And now you have no choice with 12 seconds to go if you're Georgia, but to call a timeout. Week 13 for Monday Night Football. Two of the NFC's best will meet. Vikings, Seahawks, it's Kirk Cousins. And Dalvin Cook will head to Century League to take on Russell Wilson. 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ESPN, ESPN Deportes, and the ESPN app. Our coverage begins with Monday Night Countdown at 6. They had one more second back to the 
clock. So 13 seconds for the dogs, but they've got two timeouts. Yeah, and Georgia Tech, I would anticipate playing some softer zone coverage here. They're not going to let a ball go over their head in this moment. So if you're Georgia, play calling wise, work somewhere around the hashes, get a completion. You make sure you tell your players, listen, if you catch this ball, don't go running around all over the place. Get what you can get, get down with the football, and then be ready to make a quick timeout because maybe that saves you a chance for a shot at the end zone. But you don't want to catch this ball and waste time side to side and you can kill three or four seconds. Easy completion, get the first down, timeout, and maybe you have a shot at the end zone. Rodrigo Blankenship made a Rose Bowl record field goal. 55 yards last season. So you only have to go another couple of yards to be inside of what would be his range. And Georgia starts the third quarter with the ball. From a bullet, and that's well executed. Demetrius Robertson makes the catch. Down to seven seconds to go in the half. There should be another second put back on this clock, and if that's the case, I'm running one more play. Absolutely, I would. Uh, I would take 87. I would take 87 Simmons, and I would take Matt Landers, put him on the outside, and tell Jake Fromm, listen, if they play one on one, take your shot. The ball has to land in the end zone, has to get up early, has to land in the end zone, and if it's not there, this ball gets thrown out of bounds quickly and we kick our field goal. Is that too much of a risk to take with only eight seconds on the clock when you're talking about a ball that in the air is probably going to travel about 30 yards or so? But that's why, why not just ask Rodrigo Blankenship, where do you want to kick this from? Kirby Smart probably already knows. Hand the ball to DeAndre Swift, run it that way, call your timeout, and get the three before halftime. Yeah, because if the opportunity is there for you to take your shot, I like taking the shot. Like, if they're going to line up and play man coverage, but you have to tell Jake Fromm, this is a catch it and throw the ball. And it has to land in the end zone. It can't land at the one-yard line. They've got Simmons up by himself. And I think that that's what they're going to do. One-on-one -on -one right here. You throw a fade. It has to get up and down fast. And if not, you throw the ball out of the end zone. Out of, out of bounds. Fromm instead is going to sprint right. And I'm not sure if that was a play just designed to eat up a few more seconds to make sure that the field goal is the final play of the half, but that's what they're going to play for. That, that's the play they should have run six weeks ago when we had them against South Carolina at the end of the game, remember? Um, I don't love that play call there. I would have loved to see seen a shot, and, and let's go see if we can go make that play, and if not, we kick the field goal. Are you more angry about the play call than maybe that I was right? I could see it grinding on you a little bit. Timeout's going to be called by Jeff Collins. Took you to November 30th. <laughs> to really annoy you? No, to finally get one right. There you go. <laughs> Pretty much. No, I, I annoyed you week one. <laughs> I love you. Now, my question would be, if you're Jeff Collins, do you really think you're going to ice a kicker that made game-tying and go-ahead field goals in the Rose Bowl in the national championship game when... It's four seconds to go before halftime. I mean, you can't take the timeout with you. I guess yeah. you might as well call. And I think Jeff Collins is one of those coaches who just believes in a process, and it doesn't matter what the situation is or who it's against or whatnot, who the kicker is. If I've got the timeout in this moment, I'm going to take it. Second all-time leading scorer in SEC history, Rodrigo Blankenship from 42. Georgia Tech here at Bobby Dodd Stadium. Get 
Georgia Tech gets something going offensively. Can the dogs iron out Jake Fromm? We're about to find out. Bob Wachusett alongside Dan Orlovsky. Allison Williams will join us in just a moment. We talked about it right at the start. There are bigger fish to fry than just this game for Georgia. Got an SEC championship game next week. Would you feel more or less confident heading towards the games that are really going to define their season if you're a Georgia fan based on what you saw in the first 30 minutes of this one? Much less confident. And we've been sloppy offensively with our special teams. Blaylock had fumbled the punt. Punt return. Uh, DeAndre Swift fumbled. Jake Fromm has missed multiple throws with his accuracy. We don't have a receiver right now that is separating first coverage. Georgia Tech has 70 yards of offense. This should be a dominant game for Georgia, and it just has not felt that way, and so I would be less confident. Tech won the toss and took the ball to start the game. So that means Georgia gets an opportunity to start the third quarter with the ball and a short kick to the far side. And this could backfire on uh, Georgia Tech. As Blaylock brings it all the way out near midfield, Allison. Creating turnovers and taking chances. That is how Georgia Tech has kept this game close. As I talked to Jeff Collins at the half, he said that has to continue in the second half. It loves the energy and competitiveness these guys are showing. They're not worried about the scoreboard. They just continue to play physical and attack success. As for Georgia, head coach Kirby Smart telling me at the half, the reason we haven't seen receiver George Pickens is, quote, a team matter. He said, we'll see if we see him in the second half, and he is out there, guys to start. So that was a first half benching. For whatever reason, Kirby Smart sat down George Pickens, but he is out there to the top of your screen to start the second half. And here's DeAndre Swift getting lost behind his own massive offensive line and picks up seven yards. I mean, I'd like to see Pickens get some good run this second half as well. You know, I... I think you go and score some points here if you're, you're Georgia, and then let's get him some touches. Let's get him into the rhythm of this offense, feeling good going into next week. He's going to have to be such a big contributor. These numbers again, I think they could run to Georgia's left here. Got numbers up running to the left. Right up the middle, it's Swift. Easily picking up a first down. Let's take a look. Pacific Life game summary from the first half, and Jake Fromm started off shakily, to say the least. Well, Jake Fromm, I mean, he's a sharp quarterback. He just hasn't looked it today, whether it's been some off-time throws or misplaced throws. We saw Blaylock with the fumble on the punt return. The onside kick was big for Georgia Tech. It didn't get any points, but just the feel of the football game again, and then Swift gets a helmet put on the football. That's why this game, to Allison's point, has been close because of those miscues. Didn't get his head around. Flag out. Trey Swilling. He was there in coverage. Pass interference defense, number three. Automatic first down. That's a tough call on Trey Swilling as George Pickens was not even looking for the football. Watch Pickens release. Little hand fight. He's not even looking for the football. Certainly not in the location where Jake Fromm threw it. I, I don't see pass interference there. I don't. I, both those guys are either pushing each other or grabbing each other, but there was not a one more dominant than the other shove off or grab. Trey Swilling's father, Pat, one of the legends of Georgia Tech football, college football Hall of Famer, and a five-time Pro Bowler. He, of course, was a defensive lineman watching his son play corner. And that time flagged. So Georgia in the red zone. They go that way again. Climb on the ladder, Tyler Simmons. Right over the top of Trey Swilling for the touchdown. Watch Simmons, okay. Stack the receiver, then squeeze the DB. And that allows that space for Jake Fromm to throw that back shoulder fade. But you see how he wins? and then leans back into that defensive back, then Jake Fromm has all the space to see, and he can make those notorious back shoulder throws. That's a tone-setting drive to start off the third quarter for Georgia. The college football playoff top 25 ranking show, Tuesday at 7 on ESPN. 
Well, LSU found themselves in the number one hole a couple of weeks ago in the number two hole this week. And Heisman hopeful Joe Burrow and the Bayou Bengals want to stay perfect against Texas A&M and Death Valley. The Tigers have had this one circled for a while. Remember 74-72 in seven overtimes last year in College Station. It's Saturday Night Football presented by Hampton by Hilton on ESPN at 7 Eastern, 6 Central. Blankenship sends one deep. Well, Georgia's defense has been dominant. It started up front, the defensive line. Michael Barnett just watched the extension off the ball. Push, bench press, nowhere for the tailback to go. Then we go to Tyler Clark. Watch this swim move. As fast as he gets through the guard, quarterback doesn't need that football yet. Chase down the ball carrier, bounce it outside to Monty Rice. And then Jordan Davis, you want to see strength. Watch this bench press, bench press, move. Shed that blocker and make the tackle. Georgia's defense has only given up 70 yards today. It's because they've absolutely owned the line of scrimmage up front. Jordan Mason. He moves the pile for about two and a half yards. You know, back to LSU for a moment. Were you surprised at all? And did you have any problem at all with Ohio State jumping up to the number one spot? LSU dropping down to number two off the win. Listen, you can make the case for either of them to be one, right? Like, you can, I think that there is a benefit because if things continue and Chalk wins out, you don't have to play Clemson in the semifinal. Um, but you can make the case for LSU or Ohio State being one. Screen pass, Malachi Carter. Well designed for Georgia Tech to midfield. That's the kind of play they needed trying to get back in the game. J.R. Reed brings him down after a 23-yard game. Again, utilizing the tight end motion. Tyler Davis came across. Georgia tried to pressure it, which is what they've done all first half. Georgia Tech dials up the screen against it. Davis with a great block and a little bit of rhythm or momentum for this Georgia Tech offense. And they get Carter and Amari and Brown more involved in the second half. Trying to get outside, just can't beat the speed sideline to sideline of that Georgia defense. LeCount and Webb had no problem bringing him down before he got back past the line of scrimmage. Goodness, Richard LeCount came out of nowhere. I mean, just flew downhill to knock Mason off with Webb. Screen back the other way, and it's not there. Trying to get it back to Malachi Carter. And that play short circuited from the very start. Read nicely by Tyson Campbell. It, it's really a read screen. You know, they, they motioned the back out quickly and they're going to try and get him to the boundary. And the quarterback reads it front side. If it's not there, he comes to the back side. Good kind of overall defense from Georgia. Third down, Mary, Marion Brown. He's the guy that they've at least tried to in the pass game. He's right here down in the slot. Now they're flipping both him and Tobias Oliver. Play clock at four. Got to get set. Play clock at two. Did he get set? I'm not sure. Out of trouble is Graham. And he's going to throw it away. It just didn't seem like there was a sense of urgency to get that ball snapped and get set for Georgia Tech offensively. We have two wide receivers talking to each other as the play clock goes down to zero. Well, I promise it's because they put Amari and Brown somewhere thinking, okay, we're anticipating this coverage. Then they got what Georgia was going to do, and they flipped him and Tobias Oliver because they really wanted to throw it to the third receiver who was Tobias Oliver. So they flipped those guys, and it just took too much time for that communication. Harvin, spiraling kick that's got way too much air under it as we go through the back of the end zone. 50-yard punt. But Brom will have it at his own 20-yard line. College football presented by Track Phone on ABC is brought to you by General Mills. Bring more to your game day with General Mills tailgate recipes. See what you can create at wearetailgatenation.com. And checks, pre-game to post-game. Checks is full of possibilities. 
he wouldn't become Megatron until he got to Detroit. But when he was here, he was the best ever at Georgia Tech. We always have, in honor of the 150th anniversary of college football, our vote as to the best of the hometown program. And Calvin Johnson, hard to argue against that selection. Honorable mentions, not too bad as well. But Dan Orlovsky, alongside Bob Schusen, Allison Williams down the field. I'm standing next to a guy that threw a few <laughs> to Megatron. He wasn't bad. Oh, man, dude. In uh, 2008, I was starting a bunch of games for lines. I threw 13 touchdowns, 13 of them to Calvin. So. <laughs> father of his own. He's the son of Mookie, former all-star point guard in the NBA. I think his, name should, his number should be 10, though. Oh, quick Calvin story. We're going to play the Colts. The Colts played two coverage back in the day. They played cover two or cover three. And so they, we just put Calvin by himself, and we were going to run like a five-yard hitch route. And I went to our coach and was like, what happens if they, don't, they play cover two? There's going to be a corner sitting right there. And he was like, just throw it to him. <laughs> So we get in the game, and I was like, and with the play happens, it's cover two, it's happening. I just go, all right, I'm just going to launch this to Calvin. Sure enough, 35 yards later in the completion, I was like, okay, that was relatively easy. It looked a little hard for Jordan. Matt Landers had that one sail over his head from Jake Fromm. When you saw him maybe in practice or in the film room, the weight room, whatever, I mean, take us behind the scenes a little bit into the world of playing with and alongside Calvin Johnson and what we may not have seen. We saw his dominance on the field, but what led up to it? Well, Calvin was the most physically gifted person I'd ever been around, but he worked like he was an undrafted rookie free agent every single day. He worked like if he made a mistake, he was going to get cut. And his commitment to his craft and working on the things that he wasn't great at was so impressive every day, attacking the things. Calvin wasn't a great natural catcher of the football. I've never seen anybody spend more time on a jugs machine pre- or post-practice making difficult catches. Like, he would never just stand there and go and shoot it right at him. His body would always be contorted different ways. He would run with blindfolds. He would only use one hand. Run with blindfolds? He would, he, he would do jugs machine with blindfolds. They would go ball. Really? Just, it, it, it was unbelievable. I don't That's think I've ever heard of that one. The talent, was, the talent was great. The work ethic and the character was... Eli Wolf breaks a tackle. Eli Wolf looking for the pylon. Dragged down inside the 10. First and goal, Georgia at the 8. 46 yards for Eli Wolf. Really good job there on third down. And Eli Wolf just running away from contact. He's man to man. The DB's kind of pulling on him. He's strong enough to run away. And good runner's throw by Jake Fromm. Slant, broke it up. But to the intended receiver, it looked like David Curry underneath had a chance. If he got his hands up quickly enough to maybe pick that one off. Second down and goal for the eight. Tavius Glampton, fifth-year senior, one of the two seniors on the Georgia Tech defense is down, so we'll step aside. This offensive line for Georgia, why are they so good? So it starts on the outside, left tackle Andrew Thomas. Watch him, left arm extend. That gives Swift the edge. Well, we could flip it to the right side. Another big boy, Isaiah Wilson. You're going to see the same thing. Watch him turn. Turn the defender. That gives Swift the seam. And then you're going to see some center stuff. Cade Mays, the right guard, naturally, at center. Watch him right arm push, climb up to the backer, behind Ben Cleveland, open a big hole for Zamir White. So much talent, strength, and size up front. From floats one back of the end zone for Pickens incomplete. There's the flag. Looks like they flagged Samari Walton. That's a good call. I mean, Pickens did such a nice job of selling that run. Kind of came down towards 
catch the football, sold that his, he was going to be blocking that safety with his eyes and just his body language. And it fooled Walton as he broke up field. He had no choice but to tug on him. First and goal of the four. I like this. Direct snap to DeAndre Swift. Lost the ball. Georgia Tech's got it back. Trey Swilling on the second fumble of the day for DeAndre Swift. And now Swift is down. And he really looks hurt. David Curry brought him down and helped knock the ball out. today for DeAndre Swift but a much bigger concern that's the best skill position player for a Georgia team that has an SEC championship game a week from today to worry about and also has if they can find a way to win the SEC championship game a college football playoff to worry about never fun to assume right just obviously favoring something there it's like something in his midsection. Trying to hold on to that left arm. And we will see if Allison can maybe get a peek over on the Georgia sideline to the progress Here's of what DeAndre I don't, Swift. This is what I don't like, though. Why is the ball in your right arm? All the defenders are coming from your right. Keep it in your left arm. You can use the right arm to stiff arm Curry there. He's a great back. There's no debating it. But that is, is youth football stuff. You're running away from people. Tuck that ball in your left arm. Use your right arm to shield. Mason to the five-yard line. Gain him about a yard and a half. We talked about Georgia Tech offensively a little bit and kind of what they like to do. This is certainly an opportunity to take one of those shots. Maybe to Malachi Carter, someone that you feel could potentially win on a route, utilize some play action, protect your quarterback, and take one of those big shots. Tipped ball! And a tip drill falls incomplete in the secondary. Fortunately so for the Yellow Jackets. Tyler Davis, the intended receiver, but a chance for Georgia to get a takeaway, and they couldn't find the carol. This is like one of the worst feelings in the world if you're a quarterback. Like, you see the ball just continually get tipped, but count the last one to touch, you're like, please just get to the ground. If I'm Georgia Tech, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move the pocket here. I'm going to cut the field in half for my quarterback and make sure he's not sitting back there. So move the pocket, little sprint out and give him just a very simple one to two read, and if it's not there, he can run with it. James Graham will hand one off to Mason, and he has no chance to get anywhere near the first down line again. He barely got back within a yard of the line of scrimmage, and now the clean old-fashioned hate just got a little less clean in the back of the end zone. at 73. Forward progress was stopped well outside the end zone. And Jordan Mason took exception after the whistle had blown. Wesley Harbin from the back of the end zone now to punt. Georgia Tech 41-yard line. We have multiple flags thrown, four of them in all, all over the field.
obviously have a referee microphone issue. So we've got fouls on both teams. They will offset, and that will bring back Presley Harvin onto the field to punt it from the back of the end zone again. And I'm not sure he wouldn't want another try, because that was not his best punt, only 38 yards. These are also kind of dangerous for the punt team, because... But 10 of those guys just sprinted downfield. I know it wasn't a bomb, but they all just took a 40-yard sprint. There's a little bit of cardio stress on that one, and you got to be very smart here if you're the punter just to make sure you don't outkick coverage because those guys could be a little bit more gassed. Blaylock isn't worried that Harvin's going to get off a good one. He's at the 45-yard line of Georgia Tech. And there's a wobbly kick. That will bounce. And will barely make it across Tech's own 40. 36-yard punt that time. All sports center from L.A. tonight after Arizona, Arizona State with Stan and Neal. We'll have the best college football rivalry week reactions, plus our college football expert, Heather Dinich to tell which teams could make the playoff after the rivalry games are played today. We'll also break down Hawks Rockets with Trey Young and James Harden squaring off Sports Center after the college football duel in the desert on ESPN and the ESPN app late tonight. Samir White in a tailback with the Andre Swift hurt on the sideline. Cook in motion, Vaughn looks that way and instead takes a shot to Pickens. Wide open for a walk-in touchdown. Let's watch Cook and this corner is going to drive it. That's what allows Pickens to get wide open. That corner, seeing that bubble motion come, anticipates and it's a nice job by Pickens of throwing that hand up. Remember, they had run that play in the first, pat, first half and had kicked it out to James Cook. The corner jumped it, easy touchdown, Georgia. It was a first half suspension for George Pickens. He might be back in Kirby Smart's good graces now. Let's take a look at Do More in a Jiffy, brought to you by Jiffy Lou. And for Georgia today, Dan, they've gotten production from a lot of different places. Nine different people have touched the football. Blankenship with the big kick. Harry and finishes a run. Jake Fromm has had some timely throws to Charlie Werner. We just saw one to George Pickens to finish off. A quick drive for them. Nine different people touched the football. That was the goal today for Georgia. Tobias Oliver. Ten-yard line is brought down. Prather Hudson makes the stop. Guys, DeAndre Swift is sitting on the trainer's table. He is holding that left shoulder. It's a left shoulder injury that will keep him out the rest of this game. He's got the shoulder pads off. So that is a big concern heading towards next week's championship game for Georgia. They seem to have this game comfortably in control, but no Lawrence Cager, maybe no DeAndre Swift. I'm not a lip reader, but I think he just told the teammate if they said it wasn't bad. So, I mean, just off that could be a very good sign in what could be a, a not, not great situation for him. Tyler Davis. He picks up about two. And by Tyson Campbell. Coming over to check on him as well as DeAndre Swift that had one lost fumble yeah. and nearly 430 carries before today. He's lost a couple of fumbles today. Hurt on that last fumble, although Georgia Tech could do nothing with it. His run game's got no chance against that defensive front. Jordan Mason shut down behind the line again. 
Loss of four. Now it will be third down and long. I think one guy that has probably been as impactful as anyone on this defense has been Tyler Clark, number 52. His movement, his quickness off the ball has been so spectacular all season for this defense. And it's allowed some other guys to get one-on-one -on -one matchups. He's been a really good player for them. Still think Georgia Tech should try to work the middle of the field here like they did early on in that first, being a part of the first half. Sprint out for Grant. To the sideline. Malachi Carter had to go right through his hands. He got walloped by Eric Stokes. It's another three out for Georgia Tech. This Georgia defense has just been suffocating all day. The flow from everybody. Running to the football, coverage being good. J.R. Reed did such a nice job of staying in between the receiver and the quarterback there. James Graham couldn't throw the kind of placement that he wanted to Malachi Carter. Much better kick this time for Presley Harvin. Blaylock to midfield. Still on his feet. All the way down inside the 35 of Georgia Tech. A 31-yard punt return for Dominic Blaylock. like a Georgia Bulldog fan but wanted to look but that is not an image that a dogs fan wants to see when you know you're already without Lawrence Cager DeAndre Swift and it's a left shoulder injury according to Allison and he is done for the rest of the day at least hopefully whatever it is it's not serious enough there's no reason to bring him back now into a 31 to 7 game you hope that they'll be able to get him with treatment through the week and he'll be ready to go next it, week it'll be the number one question Kirby Smart gets asked today after the game Monday at his press conference Tuesday it, it will be the only the number one talking point for Georgia moving forward into next Saturday what is his health Green pass, James Cook. Dalvin's little brother weaving his way for a first down into the red zone. Well, guys, Jake Crom came over to check on his running back, DeAndre Swift, spent about a minute with him, and then he turned to that guy who just caught the ball right there, James Cook, and said, hey, I'm going to need you. Well, he wears number four for a reason. His big brother has put together a tremendous season for the Vikings. Crom threw it out of bounds. Pierre's Jackson. Well, James Cook is a guy that they wanted to get touches to coming into today, and it was really like we got to figure out the package that is good for him. We've seen him kind of stretched out as a receiver a little bit. They've handed it off to him. Jet sweep. He obviously opened up Pickens for the last touchdown. There's a lot of good things that they can do with James Cook, putting him on the field. And if DeAndre Swift is healthy, both of them at the same time, that will stress defenses. Tyler Simmons on the end of the round. Little high step down the sideline. Georgia is back inside the 10-yard line once again, first and goal. Yeah, I, mean, I think going into next week, I, I know that Georgia wants to run football, and that's who they are, and their offensive line is dominant. But I think that they need to utilize those guys out in space a little bit next week. Like, get Cook out, in, out in, on the perimeter. Get Swift as a pass catcher out on the perimeter. We've seen Tyler Simmons do some nice things. I just, I don't think you're just going to line up and go, here comes... Two tight end personnel, we're going to run our basic run game and think that you're going to be able to hang 30, 35 points and win next weekend. So I do like some of the stuff we've seen on the perimeter day by this Georgia offense. Pickens looking for back-to-back -back scores. will be second down the goal. And this is, this 
is the, the, the reality. People don't like to hear this, but this is why George Pickens hasn't grown to... That's a bad route. He runs to the front pylon, and there's nowhere to throw the football. Calvin Johnson, we talked about him. Calvin would just go straight vertical, and he would run to the back pylon, but leave you three or four yards to the sideline. And then as a quarterback, I can throw three or four different balls. Jake Fromm had no option there. That ball had to get thrown away. And that's going to show itself next week is what receiver, when they're lined up there, can run the right kind of route and give me options. Incomplete. Jalen King with pretty good coverage. Knocked it away from Wolf. Third down and goal. I think they need to get into some kind of, you know, stack or bunch and bring somebody to the back of the end zone. I want to see someone that can get two yards from the end line and throw a ball up high, make safeties jump up on something shallow and throw a ball up high right in the back of the end zone. From floats one. Perfectly timed for Blaylock for the touchdown. Gets into it with Trey Swilling on the other side of the field. And there may have been some punches thrown. And if punches were thrown, then ejections will be had. games are fun, but that is not what you want to see. Now the officials have to sort this out, and now it becomes who saw what. Yeah. I, I think that Georgia fans are going to be upset. The reality is I think they're going to be upset once the officials do what they do and everyone sees what happened on video. Because the reality is it's going to hurt the football team. Now we've had a referee microphone situation all afternoon. So I don't know we're going to get a clear explanation here. We'll see. That's unsportsmanlike conduct, most likely on Pickens, and I'm sure the same on Swilling. And there's the disqualification signal. So it looks like Pickens has been kicked out of the game for throwing a punch. All right, let's look at the touchdown. It's a great job of from getting through some reads and again finding the back of that end zone right there and a nice touch ball to Blaylock. But let's watch the fight. This is why it's selfish. Okay, watch the right hand for Pickens come in. Okay, that's not good. And here's the thing. I get it. Emotions run high. Guess what? Trey Swilling doesn't have a game next week. George Pickens does. George Pickens probably not going to be playing a part of that football game. And that hurts the Georgia football team. So is it selfish? Yes. You put yourself in front of the football team in that moment. And is it hard to handle it with all your emotions? Absolutely. So Pickens is done. And without a referee's microphone, of course, we're not able to hear if the same was said about Trey Swilling, but didn't look like Trey Swilling, Trey Swilling got the thumb. It was just Pickens that right now is being taken back to the Georgia locker room. So after a first half benching for what Kirby Smart said was a team matter for George Pickens, he doesn't get through the third quarter before a fight gets him kicked out of the game. It's selfish. I don't care who started it. I don't care. 
It doesn't matter. George Pickens, as a young kid, I get that, but he has to have composure in that moment and think of the Georgia Bulldog football team and not him just proving how tough he is. The dogs on top. And guys, Kirby Smart earlier in this quarter had just come over and told his offense to kind of watch their emotions and make sure they're playing controlled. He had just been warning uh, his guys about this. And when Pickens came off the field, he was trying to plead his case. Coach Smart saying, he punched me in the throat first. Yeah, he did. I get that. But everyone knows, like, then let Swilling get the penalty. And you show some maturity and some growth. I get it. You guys are hand fighting, and that mush to the face is not cool. But you got to know in that moment, you can't retaliate. You're going to miss the first half of the SEC title game next week when your team needs you because you wanted to get yours. And again, Trey Swilling isn't going to get penalized next week. They don't have a game. Georgia has the most important game, arguably, of the college football season. It's just, listen, because that is truly a playoff game. you got to figure the winner of that game, is it? they're moving on. The right. loser of that game might be on the outside looking in, depending on what happens with the rest of this rivalry Saturday and the other championship games next week. I've had multiple coaches always prepare us for those moments and say, you, what you, what your ego cannot get in the way of what's more important for the football team. And George Pickens' ego got in the way there. Let's check in with Cassidy. Thanks, Bob. And now for today's All-State Mayhem moment. After leaving the game with an apparent knee injury, Justin Fields returns with a knee brace and on his very first play back, rolls to his left and fires this strike to Garrett Wilson. After a scare, Fields appears to be just okay. Bob, Dan, back to you. Well, you want to become a legend for the Buckeyes, you get knocked out with an injury, you come back in with a brace on, and you fire touchdowns against Michigan. And it's good to see that he's healthy, right? I mean, that is... He didn't look healthy. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, I mean, obviously healthy enough to throw a perfect yep. throw. He's gutting it out, and, but he didn't look like himself. Beat down Michigan. Thinking of that game, like, in the fight we just had, that reminded me of the Charles Woodson, David Boston, remember, altercation. But that was a quick one. There was a couple jabs thrown, and it was quick, and it was obviously a different time 20-something years ago. And it looked like we have a technician out on the field from the house here at Bobby Dodd Stadium trying to fix the referee's microphone. Now we've got a line of communication back. Hopefully there won't be any reasons like the one we just saw to use it the rest of the way. But still a lot of time to go in this game. Four and a half minutes to go in the third quarter. And Graham running to the sideline. Pick up about three. Run out by Walter Grant. I think that's a really good play by Walter Grant because when I saw him hunting there, I was going to be, uh-oh, because that was going to be a late hit on the sidelines. And so just in those moments, really good kind of situational maturity to pull off and not take a dumb penalty. lost in the performance today by the offense for Georgia. Obviously, now you have a fight, a rivalry game, but for Kirby Smart, his defense mm -hmm. continues to put up historic numbers. I mean, the record that they had set as a Georgia defense for fewest points allowed through 12 games in a season is 198. So far this season, they have allowed 126 points. I think, you're, I think that record I mean, that's, that, that's, that's the That's the Ray Lewis Ravens. I mean, that's that's the 46 defense. That's any great Alabama defense you've ever heard of. This, this, to, a, to go through an entire season and allow what amounts to 
about 10 points a game. It's crazy. And there are only three teams that have, have, haven't allowed 21 all season. Ohio and, State. And if you had to bet right now, all three would probably be in the playoff yeah. if Georgia could make it. Yeah, I mean, Ohio and, State, Clemson, and Georgia. And don't forget, Kirby was part of a team like this, what, in like 2015 when he was the defensive coordinator at Alabama, where absolutely dominant defense, good on special teams, you know, an offense that had some question marks. But he knows how to kind of play this style of football and win with this style of football because one unit is absolutely elite. That was an elite punt from Presley Harmon. 57 yards, no return opportunity. And tonight at 7 Eastern, talk about elite. Joe Burrow has been that Heisman hopeful on ESPN and the ESPN app. One week ahead from playing there. They'll have to stay perfect in Death Valley against Texas A&M. Saturday Night Football on ESPN presented by Hampton by Hilton as the Bayou Bengals ranked number two and we already know what we're going to see next week in the SEC Championship game and it's going to be that LSU offense they have put up tremendous numbers against a historic Georgia defense. Dan, which one do you think wins out? Well, it's interesting because LSU, not great running the football. Georgia's great at stopping it. LSU, great at throwing the football. And Georgia's been good stopping the pass. Um, I, I think Georgia will be equally on par with Auburn defensively. You know, as far as challenging LSU, El Auburn kept LSU to 23 points. And so I think Georgia can sniff in that world just because their coverage is so good. Can they shut down the RPO game for LSU? And, and then does Georgia have enough to score 24, 28 offensively to really give themselves the chance in the fourth quarter? But the defense will be good enough to keep them in the ball game. Jake Brom's day is done. Stetson Bennett in a quarterback. Samir White mashes his way for a first down behind that offensive line for the Dogs. That continues to change the line of scrimmage. Every play, Solomon Kimbley got a little something to say after the play was over. But Jake Fromm now 34 and 6 as a starter in his Georgia career, assuming that the Dogs can hold on and win here. I'm a Jake Fromm fan. I've said it. I think he's got outstanding character. His ball placement has not been what it, you know, historically has been, certainly in the last six, seven weeks, but I'm a fan of him as a player. I think he always gives him, his football team the best chance to win the game. Bennett throws one away, and let's check in with Cassidy. Bob, just want to remind people, coming up next on ABC, number 12, Wisconsin, number 8, Minnesota, duke it out, not only for the Axe, but a spot in the Big Ten title game. That one is coming your way, 3.30 Eastern on ABC and the ESPN app. Bob, Dan, back to you. will be a great atmosphere. That's a really interesting game as well. We saw Minnesota last week against Northwestern. We've had Wisconsin earlier this year, and you now it's going to be a Minnesota offense that can beat you through the air. Can they shut down Taylor and the run game for Wisconsin? Yeah, if Minnesota's defense kind of just plays good, they don't have to play great. Cook picks up a first down. They, they don't have to play great, but play good against Jonathan Taylor and doesn't allow just Wisconsin just flat out own the football game. I do think that their offense is explosive enough. They have such a unique run pass option game. They work the middle of the field and Tanner Morgan is so efficient at their quarterback, is so efficient with his ball placement and movement. Um, you know, it'll be interesting. That's the matchup. For me, it's not Wisconsin offense, Minnesota defense. It's it's Jimmy Leonard and the Wisconsin defense versus all the stuff Minnesota does RPO-wise. Cook. Near midfield. Five yards on first down. And, and Bateman, right? Bateman at receiver for Minnesota, who's a Georgia kid who always wanted to play at Georgia, and they never offered him until late, or didn't he come into the picture until late. Does, does Wisconsin have anyone who matches up against them? That'll be a very interesting kind of finite view is who Wisconsin feels good about putting on Bateman.
Step aside, head to the fourth with Georgia firmly in control, getting set to play right up the street in a week. As we get ready to start the fourth quarter here in Atlanta, we honor those who serve, brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union and salute Lieutenant General Michael Minahan from the U.S. Air Force. He is the father of Georgia Tech offensive lineman Mikey Minahan. And Mikey grew up all over the world with his dad in the Air Force. He lived in Germany, South Korea, and seven different states, including Hawaii, where his dad is currently stationed. He, he said his father is just amazing. What he does, he doesn't talk about it a whole lot, but he comes home, spends time with his family. He's just a great example for everyone. And he said he's all about doing whatever it takes and never giving up. And this Thanksgiving, one of many holidays they did not get to spend together. So we thank not just Lieutenant General Minahan for his service, but also his family for the sacrifices they made. And those of us that work at ESPN, oftentimes we'll spend some holidays away from our family and we'll complain about it. You'll be on the phone kind of moaning and groaning. I miss the kids for a few days. And then you realize that those who serve, they miss all of the holidays and they miss months and at times years. And uh, we can't thank them enough for their service. Amen. Oftentimes so we can enjoy it, right? Like we can enjoy it. Words are never enough um, for the, the sacrifice of those who serve. Just consistently saying thank you and thank you. Like he lost about a half yard, so it'll be third down and a long six. I think as this game has gone on, the really interesting thing is number four. To me, it really is James Cook and all the different stuff that they have done with James Cook. Make no bones about it. Like that is going to be a part of this package moving forward for them next week. But you'd have to imagine that James Cole and his staff have other stuff off of it. I talked about it often today that they're going to be able to show LSU some stuff and there's going to be other wrinkles to just some of the formations or, or ways they use number four today. That's a bad for the chance to put one in the air. Sidearms won easily for a first down. Landers knocked out of bounds. Just shy of the 15-yard line. And a 26. Offensive coordinator James Coley formulate a game plan for next week without Lawrence Cager. And you keep your fingers crossed if you're a Georgia fan, he's not without DeAndre Swift. And that will be the biggest challenge because it's going to have to be a game plan that, first of all, you've got to go be aggressive early on. But you got to play to your strength and aware of that. And then it's a, it's a game plan that you want to control the football just a little bit, but you have to score points. You, you have to four points against the LSU offense. So that'll be the massive challenge for Coley. I'd imagine that game plan starts at about 4 o'clock this afternoon. There will be not much time wasted after this football game moving forward. And these are the things, like, you got to go early on, be super aggressive, try to get LSU from playing from behind. And then defensively, you can't just get to Joe Burrow. you got to finish him to the ground. We've seen him escape tacklers so often this year. And then I really think you got to dare LSU and Clyde Edwards Elaire to go, all right, run for 250 on us. I dare you to. I'm going to shut down the receivers in your pass game. And if you run 250 and only score 28, I think that's our best chance to win the football game. Sometimes when the second and third stringers are in, you get a broken play. And that is certainly what we just had with the true freshman running back, Kenny McIntosh, going one way. And the redshirt sophomore quarterback, Stetson Bennett, thinking he might go the other. I still think these are important reps for skilled people on the outside. These are important reps for Matt Landers and Dominic Blaylock and Kiers Jackson. You know, see the coverage the right way. Run, run the route concept the right way. You know, there's this slot down here. Can you guys work your combo the right way that we want you to? And it looks that way. And a lob one towards the end zone for Blaylock. He draws the penalty flags. Christian Campbell tripped up Dominic Blaylock. But, but that's why these, these reps are important. I love that because Blaylock won. He won at the line of scrimmage. That forced a penalty. Pass interference, defense number 10. Penalty results in long back first down. Like, watch Blaylock in the slot here as he wins, okay? He's going to run this little fade. That's the matchup. Now, watch how he wins and gets outside the DB. 
Okay, continue to fight through that contact and draw that flag. It could have been easy for him to go inside and run a bad route. We're up 38 to 7. You can't get these reps back. And that was really good by a young receiver of taking advantage of the opportunity and putting a good rep on tape. Kenny McIntosh back in and the pistol formation behind Bennett on first and goal. McIntosh at the goal line. And he will add to the Georgia total. Another touchdown and another fight after the play was over. And this time the officials jump in as quickly as possible and separate Cade Mays, who's the starting right guard. And not a player that you want to lose for next week. So McIntosh gets the score, and it completes a 12-play, 90-yard touchdown drive. The second touchdown this year for Kenny McIntosh. Dave Mays is one of those Swiss Army Knife offensive linemen. He's played all up and down the offensive line. You don't want to have him fall into the George Pickens trap. Yeah, but you know my favorite part about him? His favorite country music singer is Luke Combs. You know nothing about it, but he's a big-time offensive oh, no. lineman, and he loves Luke Combs. I'm a fan of 77. Cade and I are right in the same way, Mike. NFL Primetime is back. Primetime's available Sunday through Wednesday only on ESPN+. Welcome back to ESPN College Football, presented by TrackPhone, part of the Jimmy Lou Rivalry Series. There has not been much of a rivalry contest today as Georgia Tech with Jeff Collins taking over after better than a decade of Paul Johnson and the triple option. And he is now going to try and do what he did. Now, a lot of the previous stops that he has been to. And recruit ACC level modern day football talent. As we take a look at our college football playoff rankings brought to you by PlayStation. And right now, the three teams that are in the top four are all getting work done in their rivalry games. Clemson is blowing the doors off of South Carolina. Ohio State on top of Michigan, 42 to 27. And the trickle down from that game? Is Coach Harbaugh in trouble? And if he's not, should he be? I mean, to me, yes, but everyone that's, you know, affiliated with that program or is around it, or, they say no. I mean, every, everyone's response is always being, well, who are you going to go get? You know, so, like, I, from an outsider's perspective, he was brought there with certainly and get paid there with, with a bunch of expectations, and he's now 0-5? Yeah, the expectations were you're going to beat Ohio State. Right. Or the expectations were you are going to regularly beat Michigan State or win against Penn State, get to the college football playoff. None of those things have happened. And they've gotten their doors blown off the past couple years, right? Uh, I also think, like, they continue to get really good recruiting classes. Not a ton of guys as early draft picks for Michigan, right? Devin Bush this past year. Sean Gary was an early draft pick, but certainly no one on the offensive side of the football that's been an earlier draft pick for Michigan. Georgia Tech has 10 three and outs and only seven points on the board. Yeah. And, and I'm surprised that what we were told at least yesterday would be some shots taken haven't shown up. There have not been in a game where it's lopsided towards Georgia's side, the ball has very rarely, if ever, been pushed down the field. Yeah, I mean, I think that at some point you, you move on from a quarterback and think about putting in maybe number 13, Jordan Yates, a freshman. You know, give him a chance to get some game action against Georgia. And now heaving it to the sideline. That might be intentional grounding. Called on James Graham. We'll see if they drop the flag out. It looked like he was still inside the pocket. I'm not sure that there was a receiver in the area. Adam Anderson came on a blitz, but I guess the officials are going to, in their own way, wave the white flag with George on top 45 to 7. And, and, and obviously not a great showing by Georgia Tech today. The transition is very real. I mean, they haven't had a top 40 recruiting class in the last 11 years here. That is changing right now. They're tracking at top 20. Jeff Collins knows, you know, Georgia as a Time state. I think some, so much potential. If he wins the state of recruiting, this will turn fast. Georgia calls timeout. College 
Football on ABC is presented by TrackPhone. The new TrackPhone Wireless. Now you're in control. And in part by Pacific Life. 150 years strong. Protection and retirement solutions for your future. The goal for Georgia was to spread it around to as many skilled guys as possible and get into an offensive rhythm before the SEC championship game next week. Certainly seemed to have accomplished that goal with a 45 to 7 lead under 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Bob Shuzik, Dan Orlovsky, Allison Williams, and Presley Harvin back again to punt it to Dominic Blaylock. And this punt for Harvin will be his 12th. And that ties the most punts ever in a game for Georgia Tech. And Blaylock with the fair catch. Now, why did Georgia call a timeout right before we went to commercial? Well, no moments not important for Kirby Smart. I mean, you count them off. You can only have 11 on the field. And watch as we work through it. There's going to be 12 guys left on this football. You see number 12 as the punt returner. That's why Kirby Smart called that timeout, because whether the score is 45 to 7 or it's 7 to 7, coaches like Kirby Smart that come from the Nick Saban tree, every single moment matters. So when your players watch it, you go, Coach, you can't tell me that. And then you didn't call the timeout because we were up by a lot of points. So good coaching by Kirby Smart. Kenny McIntosh. Near midfield, he picks up four. Now you're probably looking at a complete backup offensive line for Georgia. So, I mean, you got to walk away feeling good about many things. I mean, relatively healthy. Obviously, the, the biggest question is number seven, DeAndre Swift. But the off gets out healthy. Quarterback gets out healthy. You got to deal with seven. You got to deal with one. Pickens and, and Swift, but some good stuff put on tape by some young players. Um, getting in the fourth quarter help McIntosh again. There's a couple of yards shot on the first down. Let's check in with Cassidy. Bob, coming up next, will number eight Minnesota have an answer for Jonathan Taylor, number 12 Wisconsin. Taylor has rushed for over 200 yards in three straight games. Big one in the Big Ten. That's on ABC and the ESPN app. Bob, Dan. All right, Cass, thanks very much. It'll be fun to watch that game on um, Wisconsin. Row the boat. Who ends up in the Big Ten Championship? We'll find out. Third down and two. Quick hitter out on the edge. And unable to get the first down. Tommy Bush comes up short. Now it's fourth down and about a yard, and it looks like the, the punt group is going to come in for Georgia. Tony, watch this next 744 if you're a Georgia Tech fan. Just watch last seven plus minutes of the season and how hard these kids will play. It's a very young football team, but that will be the biggest sign of do these kids actually believe in what the head coach is saying? And you'll see it. These kids are going to play incredibly hard. Kamarda does exactly what you wanted to do. Although he is hurt, that shook him up and contacted behind the line. And he hops up with a limp. Good job of downing it by Tyson Campbell. But Camarda, after the end over at Trent, gets rolled up on by his own guy. We are back with today's Pacific Life game summary. Jake Fromm with four touchdown passes. That's the good news for Georgia. The bad news, DeAndre Swift. As Jordan Yates gets caught in the end zone. And he, let's see if he got the ball out to the one-yard line. It looks like he did. Check that. They got it to Jemias Griffin. But DeAndre Swift with a shoulder injury on his second fumble of the game in the third quarter. Left the game and took his shoulder pads off. And he has not left that trainer's table 
since leaving the game midway through the third quarter. I do think it's he's been sitting there for a while, and I do think it's a good sign that he's not in any kind of sling. There's not wrapped up or anything. I mean, I would assume that's a good sign. Yates, incomplete. It will be third down and about 10 from the one-yard line, third and 11. Jordan Yates, I played with Jordan Yates' uncle, TJ, with the Houston Texans, who now, he's now a coach with the Houston Texans, North Carolina grad, had some great moments as a pro, took the Texans to the playoffs twice, I think. Great, great kid, and he raves about, obviously, his nephew Jordan and his future and, and the dual threat player that he is. I think it's important for him to get some reps against a, a really good Georgia defense. He's a Georgia State Offensive Player of the Year. And here he pays the price. It's walloped at about the three-yard line. So it is yet another three and out for Georgia Tech. And that should bring us under six minutes to go. Watch on the sideline. Yeah. I said they were good reps. Maybe not some ideal hits. But good to see the young freshman from Alpharetta get in the game. Well, that might be one to worry about targeting. Presley Harvin for the back of the end zone. And this will set a new record for Georgia Tech for most punts in a game. The 13th punt. Fair catch made by Blaylock. 5-4 to go in the fourth quarter. Fun afternoon on that dog sideline. Why not? 45 to 7. Georgia has the lead on Georgia Tech. This Jiffy Loop rivalry series game. Papa Shoes and Dan Orlovsky. Allison Williams. Jake Fromm played so well he exited the game. It was done for the day. A few possessions to go. Here's Kenny McIntosh caught behind the line. Although for, Dan, for all of the positives for Georgia, there were some negatives early on that at least caused some concern heading towards the SEC title game. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it, it started for Georgia and Jake Fromm just not being able to find people. Open on third down, a missed throw. DeAndre Swift, helmet on the football. That pops out a fumble. Another one carrying the wrong hand. That pops out a fumble as they're going in and then Pickens. And this will probably be just as much of a talking point as the DeAndre Swift fumbles and injury is the lack of composure by George Pickens and how much it will hurt their football team, certainly in the first half next week in Atlanta. McIntosh almost broke free. Picks up five. Knight, true freshman linebacker for Georgia Tech is down. And Jeff Collins was very honest with us when we met him about the challenge that is out in front of a program that's going from running the triple option and having an offensive line that averaged 260 pounds a guy to try to play in the ACC and flip the program so that you are now playing true FBS level football and he was a guy that in some of his previous stops most notably about 10 years ago at Alabama was in charge of recruiting so he knows how to recruit an NFL level power five conference football player he knows what those guys look like and he believes in taking this job that Georgia Tech can get back to being that I like the NFL point that you made because speaking with him, I had him last year at Temple, and then speaking with him, as you can see the career kind of the path for him, it really started. He grew up here falling in love with this school and rivalry, and then you mentioned his ties to Alabama and the talent that he brought in there, and then some really successful stops at some SEC programs. I mean, Temple's won seven, eight games this year, right, with some of the guys that he's brought in. But in speaking with him yesterday, 
I wrote down notes. They want NFL football players. Like, there's some programs that don't. They just want good college football. They want to bring guys in here that want to go play in the NFL. And he mentioned yesterday Georgia as a state only has two Power 5 programs. And it's the fourth best recruiting state in the country when it comes to star players and whatnot. If you can get control of your state or be in the running like Georgia is with so many of those big-time players, you can flip this real fast. And I think he will. I believe that Jeff Collins will flip the Georgia Tech really quickly and get the players he wants in here very fast to turn this program back to really well-respected. Obviously, as an outlier, wanted to play his system. He recruited to his system. And the triple option here in the academies would become a constant upset possibility for so many of the national powers because it's just impossible to practice against him. Yep. Um, and he, to his credit, was able to win a lot of football games playing that way. Here. Yeah, but you. that also now creates a totally different challenge at Georgia Tech for the next guy in that doesn't want to play that way when you come in and have a roster full of players that were built to play triple option football. Bennett out of the pocket on third down, loses his footing, and goes Superman style, and that'll be fourth down with under five minutes, under four minutes to go. And I, I think that's your point, right? I mean, not only were you just bringing in offensive linemen that were going to run the option, but receivers that weren't really okay you go play wide receiver split out and beat coverage as you see stetson bennett just all right lose balance a little bit but then defensive guys for georgia tech like defensive ivan didn't want to come here because they were going to get cut block all practice and you have guys can they play coverage so it, it's got to be a total revamping and they're on track to have a top 20 recruiting class and that is really big for Jeff Collins' future here. Good to see Kamarna shake off the ankle injury. Get away, good punt that's fumbled at the goal line in the end zone. Touchdown, Georgia. some snow football. Minnesota's Rodney Smith warming up in the snow, getting set to take on Wisconsin and try to get a trip to the Big Ten title game. Bob, Dan, back to you. Wisconsin and Minnesota, they should play in the snow. It's appropriate for that game. I like some real snow. With a bow? With a boat row in the snow? That's very creative. Keep hey, trying to come up with those combinations. You got three minutes and six seconds to get a few more. Bias Griffin gets tripped up. Or he might have had a lane all the way to the end zone. True freshman picks up 16. Again. 
So give me a wide-angle lens look then at Jake Fromm's day. You know, started off inaccurate. Yep. Found four different guys for touchdowns, and I think accomplished the goal of spreading it around to a lot of different weapons. How confident do you think he's going to be heading into that LSU game next week? I'm, I don't think you can be that confident, and it's not the confidence that Jake Fromm has in itself. I don't think there's, there's a ton of confidence in the guys around him. We, I've said that since we had them against South Carolina. Maybe a little bit with Simmons today that, like, okay, I threw him some, made some throws to him, and Blaylock had some good stuff. Those would be the two guys that Jake Fromm could at least feel pretty good about throwing the football to. And so that will be the biggest thing is when the moment comes next week and he's going to have to trust someone, who's it going to be? And I think it's got to be Simmons, and it's got to be Blaylock. Because Fromm's going to be plenty confident. So a little bit of an up and down. But next week, he's just going to have to be willing to consistently trust those two guys when it matters the most. And of course, I would imagine that they're really keeping their fingers crossed, not only for DeAndre Swift, and that his shoulder injury is not that serious. But they know they're going to be without Lawrence Cager next week. If they could find a way to pull off the upset and beat LSU, then you've got the better part of three and a half weeks to rest your best skill guys and maybe not work them hard in practice and get them through a recovery period so that you're in full strength if you make it to the college football playoff. Yeah, I mean, if they win next week, they are in. And listen, they haven't gotten turnovers defensively last year, this year. But they've been so good. I mean, you want to see some, if, you, if you're looking at something that might be able to help you swing that game, pull off that quote-unquote upset, punch at the football, get your hands on it. Those defensive linemen have to do a great job of shedding blocks and then the run pass option game, getting their hands up, maybe tip a couple balls and let that dominant defense get some turnovers for their offense to steal some possessions. Well, that defense makes one last tackle at the line of scrimmage. And that should take the clock down to all zeros. And Kirby Smart, Jake Fromm, and the Dogs will celebrate a win in their rivalry game over Georgia Tech. The final score from Atlanta, 52-7, Georgia beats Georgia Tech. For Allison Williams, Dan Orlovsky, I'm Bob Oshuzo. So long from Bobby Dodd Stadium. After a quick timeout, stay tuned. Wisconsin and Minnesota is coming up.